What's going on everyone? Welcome back to Medvice. Um, so for anyone that follows the channel, you know that I recently just took step two. And if you want to see my reaction to my score and kind of the basics of what I did to study for that, make sure you check out this video here. Um, but today I thought I would kind of do something different. A lot of people do study with me. A lot of people talk about strategies. Um, and one of the big things I said in that in that video was that you got to do a ton, a ton of practice questions. So today I thought I would kind of take you in a little bit of what I do with my practice questions and kind of how I analyze them. Because I know when people see a long question stem and they're not sure, it can be really daunting and can really create a lot of anxiety for people. So I thought today I would kind of go through my methods for how I go through each and every practice question to, to get the kind of score that I did. So as you can see here, uh, the platform I'm going to be using is Amboss. I also used UWorld a lot, but they have you know a big copyright on their questions, whereas Amboss has no issues with you copying and pasting their questions to anything like that. Um, so figured it would be better to, to use these. I like Amboss. I think uh, the questions are really good, similar to UWorld, and a lot of times actually harder, so it can better prepare you for the test. Um, so let's jump right in here. I have my exam set to step two CK. Um, I'm gonna use, I'm just gonna do all questions because there's only there's only a few that I haven't answered. So I'm just gonna set that to all questions, and then uh, we're we're gonna do let's say five. I don't want this video to be too long. Um, so we'll do five, and I'll kind of go through and talk out loud about my thought process whenever I go through questions. We'll do study mode because with with you world, you're able to do exam mode without a timer. I want to be able to talk to you guys and kind of go through my thoughts. So we'll just do study mode. We won't have it be timed, um, but I usually do most of my questions timed just so I can get a sense of what it's going to be like to be under that kind of pressure. So without further ado, let's uh, let's go ahead and click start. All right, so first question here. Uh, first thing I notice right away is that we have a picture. And my step, even before I read the question, I like to look at the pictures. So this is clearly gonna be uh, already in my head. I know it's an OB question. And before I even know what the question's about, before I read anything, I know I see we have some late decelerations here. So this definitely already is gonna help me along when I'm reading the question, gives me extra info, and I probably won't have to look at this picture later. It looks like there's not that many contractions and that we have some late decels. So now that that's going on, let's read the question. So I always start at the end and I read, most appropriate next step in management. This is a very common one for step two. So we're looking for a next step and then the next step is I briefly look over the answers just to get an idea of what kind of question we're going to be having. So again, this is OB. This is about what to do next after you see late D cells. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and read the rest. So we got a 39 year old, 41 weeks, uh, regular uterine contraction starting two hours ago, uh, complicated by iron deficiency anemia. Let's see, 90% of phase seven centimeters dilated. So she's pretty far along, vertex at minus one. Fetal heart tracing is shown. We already know what that shows. We saw the late D cells. Repositioned. Okay, so this is important. So late D cells is usually straight, is usually, um, you know, you manage, try to manage it conservatively with repositioning and oxygen. Uh, and they even did an amnio infusion. So this is saying that they've done these things and they're not working. Repeat assessment after 20 minutes shows similar cervical status, no changes in fetal heart tracing. Okay, so... This one is pretty easy. They they make it very apparent that this this baby's in respiratory stress. That's what the late D cells mean. And they've tried several things already to do um, to try to get this to calm down, and it's not. So this means that there's utero placental insufficiency, which is what late D cells mean. So we know that we're not going to want to start actively pushing. We've already tried positioning. We don't want tocolytics. Um, because that just because you stop the contractions or slow them down does not mean the baby is going to be in any less distress. We don't want to speed up contractions because that'll put baby in more distress. You can't monitor this. The, this baby's in trouble. So we're going to go to emergent cesarean delivery. And that was correct. Um, so my process for any question, whether I get it right or wrong, if I'm very confident like I was in this, I probably won't go through each and every single wrong answer just to look at the explanation. If I got the question right based on a guess or I wasn't 100% sure, I'll usually read not only the correct explanation but all of the incorrect ones. And then obviously if I get the question wrong, I will look at um, each explanation. If I need any more information, I'll, you know, click on one of these tabs and read more about it. And then um, I'll go ahead and if I did miss a question, I will add, you know, the little statement that I would have needed to get that question right into my document that I showed you guys in a previous video about how I studied for step 2CK. But just to review, this is a document of all the question, not the whole question, but things about 
pieces of information about questions that I missed that I would have needed to know to get right. So I have it broken up. Here's psych, here's peds, um, OB is right here. So if I missed this question and I wasn't sure what to do, I would read about it and understand what I would have needed to know to get this right. And then I would have added that note here so I could review it later. So that's basically what I do for my normal questions. Let's go on to the next one. All right, so starting again, first thing I do is read the answer or, or the, the last sentence in the answer. So the remainder of the exam shows no abnormalities. Which of the following is the most likely cause? So now we're looking for a cause of symptoms. We're not looking for a diagnosis. We're not looking for the next step. We're looking for a cause, which kind of helps my thinking when I'm reading this later on. So looks like somebody has some neuro problems going on. So that will help uh, clear my thinking when I'm reading the question. And I think this could be after delivery. Yep. So after a delivery has weakness and numbness of her right foot, 18 hours. That's also very important. So it's very soon after the delivery. So let's see if she got an epidural. Draggling and shuffling her foot. Prolonged labor. Okay, so this is very important. So she got an epidural and she had prolonged labor. So right away, obviously the epidural can cause like a, a heavy foot, heavy leg, and also prolonged labor. You're in that position that can compress the perineal nerve. Um, and I think that's basically it. So a lot of times, actually, if I am pretty certain about a question, I don't need to read the rest. So this right here, this is all information that just confirms what I already know. This tells you there's a perineal nerve palsy, but that there's nothing really else going on. So I don't think this is a radiculopathy. Uh, it could possibly be uh, anesthesia, so we'll keep that. I don't think it's angiopathy. I don't think it's uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve because that wouldn't have any motor issues, and that's also on the lateral leg. So this is either an effect of epidural or compression of the common perineal nerve, and the reason that I kept these two is just so that I can compare them because they both could be correct. But in this one, there is specific weakness of the right foot dorsiflexion and right ankle eversion, which are both actions of common perineal nerve, and the sensations decreased in the area of that. So I will get rid of epidural anesthesia, and the prolonged labor here was the key. The prolonged Long labor and the description of the weakness was the key here. So this is, I'm pretty confident, compression of the perineal nerve, and that is correct. So again, this one I was able to explain very confidently, so not going to go through and read all of the descriptions on this one, but again, if I wasn't super confident, I would go through and read those and read those. All right, let's take a look at the next one. All right, so we have a chart here. So this is a biostats question. Um, for these, uh, I won't go too into this one, so I, I'll skip this one because the biostats questions are very different. There's really not a whole lot of analysis or anything like that with reading the question and answers and all that. It's either biostats is one of those things where you either know how to do it or you don't. So this looks like it's talking about, you know, sensitivity, specificity, or, or you know, associated risk based on the answers. But I won't get into that because that's not really the point of what I'm trying to get here. So let's skip this one to the next one. Here we go. So a longer one, and this can be intimidating, but let's look at the last couple sentences. Large bore uh, central line is inserted in the right IJ by standard procedure, which of the following is the most appropriate next step. So this is one of those that I already know the answer. This is a very common thing, especially on your surgery and internal medicine rotation. And this happens frequently. This is why I always start reading at the last sentence or the last two sentences, because if you can read the last two sentences a lot of times, they give you all you need to know in that last sentence. So all of this is just other information about the patient I don't need to know. Probably that they're getting sick and that they had, you know, it looks like they have uh, sepsis or possibly shock, and that's why they in inserted the central line. But this question is about the central line, not about the status here. So, and that I can tell that by the way that they word this question, and it saves you a heck of a lot of time, especially if you're someone who struggled with have, not having enough time on exams before. This is really big because if you can read the last sentence or two and already understand what the question's asking, you read the answers and you're familiar and you know where to go from there, all this is just fluff. It's all filler. And this could take somebody, depending on how fast you are at reading, this could take somebody a minute to read, but I just read two sentences. I could finish this question in 10 seconds because I already know what I need to like get from the question itself. So going down to the answers, I don't, the, the question's about the central line and after a central line insertion, you always get a chest X-ray to check for proper placement. So I, I'm not giving antibiotics. I'm not getting an echo. All of this is just kind of distractor answers and this is all distractor information they want you to think maybe she's you know she's septic she's got a problem so give her antibiotics or maybe check for a ct to see what's going on but you always after a central line check a chest x-ray so i knew that piece of information i knew that that's what they were asking just by those last two senses i ignored all the fluff 
you get the right answer and you move on. And that saves you a ton, a ton of time, especially when you're stressed out in the middle of step one or step two and you can use those extra 60 seconds on a question that might be tougher. All right, uh, last question we're gonna go through here. All right, so here we have a lot of labs. Now, I'll still go down. I won't look at the labs uh, quite yet, but I will still go down and look at the the question and the answer choices. So which of the following is the most appropriate pharmacotherapy? So we're going to need to diagnose and then pick a drug. So it looks like we have some antibiotics, lots of antibiotics, lots of antibiotics. Okay, so let's go figure out what's going on. So 24-year-old, three-day history of lower abdominal pain, dysuria. Right now, after reading that, I'm already suspicious of a UTI. Let's see how bad it is, see if she maybe has some pilo. She has a history of recurring UTIs that are resolved with antibiotics, sexually active with a male partner, do not use condoms. So that's these are just risk factors. Um, mild pain during sexual intercourse one week ago. This could also be um, PUD, pelvic and or PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. So that's on the differential as well. So let's keep reading. She's febrile. She has okay vitals otherwise. Lower abdominal tenderness, bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy, small amount of purulent vaginal discharge. So, uh, so the good thing is now they gave us more information. I think it's helpful in the beginning to kind of come up with a differential right off the bat, even though I was wrong about um, – her possibly having a UTI, because um, now this is confirmed that I think she's probably got some pelvic inflammatory disease. But even though that I was wrong about my initial thoughts, I had my mind was working and my mind was thinking about different options so that when I got more information, I can make an educated decision. So uh, uterine, and that just confirms it. Yeah, that's classic on the physical exam. So let's look at the labs. I expect a high white count with lots of neutrophils, high ESR, and everything else is pretty normal. She's got back back to urea, which isn't super exciting, but her white blood cells in the urine aren't high, which tells me again that it's not a UTI. So come down here. Um, you always use dual treatment for PUD. Whenever you have a chlamydia infection, you use dual treatment with both ceftriaxone and azithromycin. So let's see if that's an option. If not, we will go with something else. So metro, no, oral doxy. A lot of times PID also needs some IM medication or IV medication. So let's see. I'm not 100%. So this is one that I'm actually not 100% sure about. So we're going to narrow down some answers. It's not a UTI, so nitro isn't going to cure it on its own. Um, I don't think it's levofloxacin. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's that. I'm leaning towards IM, ceftrioxin, and oral doxycycline because I'm because PID is a serious infection. I think you would need combination, and I don't think you would just just give IM ceftrioxin, but I'm not sure. So let's try it out. And that ended up being the right answer. But as you saw, this was one that I wasn't a hundred percent sure about. Um, so this would be one that I would read, you know, the, the correct answer explanation, which was kind of along the lines of what I was thinking, PID being a, you know, a more serious infection. So you would want combination and then, you know, the combination for chlamydia treatment as well. Um, since I skipped this one here, just because it was um, a biostats question, I will do a couple more for you guys. So let me go to analysis and I will start a new block of just a couple more. So, so same thing, we're going to start off, before I even look up here, I'm going to read down here, normal physical, normal blood gas, normal toxicology, which of the following is the best initial step. This is so freaking important, initial step. You could see three or four answer choices that make sense and that are reasonable for whatever this ends up being, but the initial step is the most important thing. So let's look at the answers here, Zeprazidone, so this looks like a psych thing possibly. Examine mother and son separately. This could be related to abuse. So this is kind of a psych abuse kind of question. So I think there's going to be some family problems. So let's read. 45-year-old woman, 17-year-old son. She believes she has been poisoned by her ex-husband. She reports that her coffee tasted strange. Of her black car driving by the house, which she concludes must have been her ex-husband. Divorced three years ago. Ex-husband. So there's some trauma there. There's some history. She's been seeking revenge and thinks that... So she sounds like she's paranoid, maybe got some schizophrenia or some delusions. The son also reports his coffee, his, mo his mother's coffee mug, so which he suspects was cyanide. So this kind of seems like a, a case with two separate opinions, and this just makes me suspicious that the son might just be going along with this just because the mom is. So he agrees with the mother's distrust, also heard a kid, but was not able to find any cameras. So... I think that the best next step, so this is one where I don't think you need to start any treatment right away or anything like that. 
family therapy kind of and I don't think you need to report to the authorities. I think the next thing to do would just be to examine the mother and son separately because if they're separate, you know, he wouldn't be there to just corroborate her story. Maybe he'd come clean and say that it, it is all fiction and he's just going along with it to not make his mom feel bad. So I think that's the right answer. And this is, this is something that's common. If you see two people going along with something, especially with a relationship like mother and son, it's a good idea to examine them separately. Same sort of thing. I said this could be abuse because it, and he's 17, but if this, you know, was with a, a, a dad and a five-year-old girl, What's the next best initial step? You want to separate them so that you can get stories from each of them without, you know, conflict because they're with each other. So, of course, maybe maybe for the, the mom, the treatment could be zoprazidone or flufenazine. But the next initial, initial step in management is to get a better history. So you want to examine them separately. So let's. this was a good example of like a psych type question. Next one, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? Okay, so we're looking for our next step, urea breath test. So this looks like H. pylori or some kind of stomach ulcer already. And I, I haven't read any of this up here yet. This is just my thoughts from reading the answers. And when you've done so many questions reading the answers, you'll get a sense for what they're going for in the question. And it's much easier because they're just they're pretty much just going to confirm what I'm already thinking up here. And that makes this a lot easier. So let's see what we got. Eight-week history of intermittent burning epigastric pain, bloated, uncomfortable after meals. So that's important because uh, certain types of ulcers, duodenal ulcers, make you feel better after meals. So that's good to know. It's probably not that. He has not had weight loss or change in bowel habits, so may, probably not cancer, which is helpful. He takes no meds, does not smoke, drinks slightly, not really super significant, but alcohol can induce ulcers or contribute. Mild epigastric tenderness on palpation without guarding or rebound. That's important, so that means they don't need to go to surgery. Bowel sounds are normal. The remainder of exam shows no abnormalities, which is the most next appropriate next step in management. So, this one, I don't think it's the IG. I, this is kind of another tricky one. You don't need an endoscopy. If there's warning symptoms of cancer, then you want to jump right to ab, uh, endoscopy. I don't think you need an abdominal ultrasound. I can't remember if there's evidence of a stomach ulcer. I can't remember if you do a urea breath test right away or if you do a trial of proton pump inhibitors first to see if that gets it. I don't think you would do eradication therapy without the breath test because that's what tells you that you have it. This one's tough. This one's a little trickier. With all with with when, with questions like this, I frequently can get down to two or three, and then I usually just go with my gut. And I gotta say. My instinct on this one tells me that you do a trial of proton pump inhibitors first without getting a urea breath test. So let's see. So this one was wrong. So this is a great example um, of what I would do with a wrong question. So I got it wrong, so I'm assuming it's, yeah, so it's urea breath test. So I guess you don't do a trial of proton pump inhibitors. So let's see. So here I would read the wrong answer choice first to see why I was wrong. Um, with PPIs is indicated only in patients with dyspepsia or strongly suggestive GERD. So he didn't really have heartburn and regurg. He just had kind of the, the symptoms of the ulcer itself. So I guess they're saying that points more likely to H. pylori. Um, so that's why they would get the urea breath test first. So what I would do here is I would take this piece of information. I would say, I would copy and say empirical therapy with PPIs is indicated only in patients with dyspepsia and strong symptoms of GERD. And I would come to my document here and I would copy that and paste that here so I could read it later you know therapy without these signs breath oh, urea breath test is next best step so now when I have time at the end of a day of studying I usually like to come back and read through this every once in a while and that would be something I would read that would over time get drilled into my head and that would make it so that I wouldn't miss that type of question again in the so future. Here's another one. So like always we're gonna start at the end and let's see what we have here. I always read the I always typically I say I read the last sentence. I usually read the last two sentences like what I talked about earlier because sometimes it gives away enough information to answer the question and I think this one probably does. He appears indifferent about his memory lapses and says this is normal for someone his age. For anyone who studied a lot and is getting ready for this, the, the appearing indifferent or not recognizing their memory lapses is pretty classic for Alzheimer's dementia. 
Most appropriate initial pharmacotherapy for this patient is a drug that acts on which of the following neurotransmitters. Okay, and we're talking about neuro. So just reading this real quick kind of confirms that, yeah, over time been losing memory, not being the same person. So needing more help around the house. Yeah, so this is Alzheimer's dementia. And I, I pretty much got that from the last two sentences. This is all fluff. I really didn't need to read. And the number one treatment for Alzheimer's dementia is going to be something like Donepazil, and that targets acetylcholine. So that one wasn't too bad. Um, again, I was confident about this one, so I won't really go through all of this. And this also saves me time during the review process. I, I've heard of friends talking about, you know, it takes them an hour to do a block of 40 questions and then they review for three hours. And I think that's a little bit too long, especially if, you know, for at least half or, you know, 70% of the questions, you're pretty confident or you know most of the information. I usually probably spend about the same time reviewing questions than I did um, with taking the test itself. So let's do one more question here and then we'll finish. All right, so here is this one. And let's go back to the, down to the bottom. Your analysis is normal. X-ray of the chest, no abnormalities. Has not lost any weight over the past year despite following supervised weight loss programs, diets, and exercise regimens. This is another question just like the one we saw earlier where they're going to ask us what to do next after things have already been tried and failed. Um, just like that other question where they were trying to do things with the woman who had late D cells with her baby. This person's been trying to lose weight for a long time, a past year with supervised weight loss. So I think they're looking for the next most appropriate step, which let's just confirm our thoughts that she is very overweight. All right, this is just giving her symptoms, a lot of fluff, a lot of fluff. Her BMI is 42, excellent. And we'll make sure there's nothing else that's gonna surprise us in labs. Well, not excellent clearly, <laughs> but um, that tells us what we need to know, that she is significantly overweight, has been trying to do weight loss, and now they're asking her us what's next. So let's go down to our answers. Liposuction, I mean, they usually never really recommend plastic surgery, and that's never been something that I've ever seen on a question to be correct, because that's temporary. That doesn't fix the problem. Metformin and statin isn't going to do anything for weight loss. Yes, she has high cholesterol and triglycerides, but again, that's not going to fix the problem. She's significantly overweight. She's already tried a lot of the weight loss stuff, and these usually don't work unless you also use diet and exercise. Behavioral therapy, I don't think that'll help. She Again, she's already tried all this stuff. Medications are not the answer for weight loss. So after trying everything, the last and final option, which seems appropriate, it's not always appropriate, but here it seems appropriate, is going to be surgery. So that is correct. Again, I was confident with this one, so not gonna go through and read. I, I know why it was right. I know why these ones were wrong. I understood the question and that saves me time because I don't have to go back and review. Um, and that just allows me to get through more questions. So, and so that's about it. So I just wanted to give you guys a little taste of what it was like to do a lot of UWorld questions or AMBOSS questions and kind of my process with going through them. I think that developing a good strategy for going through questions that you can repeat over and over and over again, like clockwork, like just a normal routine that is uh, what you do when you go through questions makes them a lot more easy. Uh, a lot more manageable so that you can get through questions at a good pace without, you know, wasting time rereading things or, um, or getting stumped over things that you didn't need to read, like fluff. A lot of times I used to read the whole question and something didn't make sense in the first part and I got stuck on it because I didn't understand it. But I realized at the end that that whole section didn't even matter because I, I had enough information from the last couple sentences. So that's why I always start there. I check out the answers to give myself an idea of what type of question it's gonna be. And when in doubt, go with your gut. As you saw, I was wrong on one of them here. So on that one, I would write down uh, the information that I would have needed to know to get that right, just like I did um, with other questions on my, my document here. And I would study and review that so that it wouldn't happen in the future. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little uh, demo of me doing some practice questions. I'm very happy to be done with my exam and not have to do these anymore. Um, but I hope this helped out. I hope you guys learn to develop some good strategies and do as well as you possibly can on all your exams. So thanks for tuning in to another episode of Medvice. And as always, I'll see you next time.